A very warm welcome from Delhi to the British Council and Artex Company webinar, Gig Workers and COVID-19, with speakers live and interactive from across India and the UK. My name is Jonathan Kennedy and I'm the Director of Arts India with the British Council. Our Festival's Connections events were originally conceived to run across metros in India, but with the onset of COVID-19, social distancing and lockdown, we've taken the sessions online. This festival's COVID-19 webinar is part of a, month, a monthly series as part of the British Council's Skilling and Capacity Development Programme with India and the UK, Festivals for the Future. This is a multi-year programme aimed primarily at emerging arts festivals, festival managers, working alongside established festivals and arts leaders. The British Council, as I'm sure you'll know, is the UK's international organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. And this is echoed in the ambitions for our festival programme for creative expression, international exchange and the enterprise economy. To date, we've developed a Festivals Academy, this webinar series with Artex, Festivals Connections Programming, India Wales Connections Through Culture Grants, Festivals Digital, and Creative Economy Research around arts and culture festivals. This session and those to come have been designed specifically to respond to the need of the hour, supporting the festivals and creative sector during and beyond COVID-19 with today's focus on gig workers is perhaps particularly pertinent. As you may know, the British Council with FICI and Artex is currently surveying the creative sector to understand how it is responding to the challenge of COVID-19. You can access the Taking the Temperature survey on the British Council's website, and I urge you to have a look at that after this session. It's early days, but the survey findings to date of which we've had around 300 reports already, show around 33% of those respondents are self-employed freelancers in the gig workforce, 32% of whom have already lost up to three gigs in the past few months, and 23% have lost between five and 10 lakhs income already. When we understand that the average income last year for gig workers and freelancers was 20 lakhs, that's pretty significant. So already the early days evidence points to the inherent vulnerability of gig workers in the wider creative economy. This is perhaps especially true during this fragile time of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are joined online today from festival leaders, artists and arts consultants in Mumbai, Delhi and Cardiff in Wales in the UK. They represent the fabulous diversity of festivals and the creative economy including amongst them Anil Chumuni, found, uh, found an MD of Turkey Music and Publishing. He has been working part, he's been a key part of the music industry for decades on, on record labels and the digital music business and curates the Paddy Fields Folk and Fusion, Fusion Music Festival since 2016. Priyanka Kimani is one of India's leading entertainment, music and intellectual property rights lawyers um, and she is also a founding chairperson of the Indian chapter of Women in, in Music, a global non-for-profit organization dedicated to championing the female voice across the global music industry. Neha Kipal is a social entrepreneur and co-founder of the mental health platform In An Hour. She founded India's first international art fair and ran it successfully for 10 years before selling the business to MCH Basel and moving on to focus entirely to her marginalized sector of mental health. And from the UK, I'm delighted that we have been joined by our British Council colleague, Rebecca Gould, who is head of Art Wales. Rebecca is instrumental in British Council art work across Wales and internationally including partnership with, partnerships with Wales Arts International, who have joined forces with us in India for the India-Wales Connections Through Culture Grant Projects, which bring together artists and festivals between both great nations. Prior to the British Council, Rebecca has also worked extensively in India, 
touring theatre, dance, and writers to festivals here for many years. In response to the rapidly evolving COVID-19 situation in India, the UK and the health, of the health and safety of our audiences, colleagues, and partners is our top priority, which is why we have responded to enable festivals to connect, create, and collaborate online for the time being. We understand that this is a difficult time for the creative sector and gig workers in festivals in particular face an uncertain future. Nevertheless, we firmly believe that culture connects us and at this time of uncertainty, creativity and collaboration binds us together. Now at this time, this is more important than ever. So for today, British Council, Artex, Arts and Culture Resources India reaches out across digital frontiers, national boundaries, in solidarity with many inspiring festivals and artists in India and beyond. And so with all that said, I'm delighted to hand over now to our tip-top host for the afternoon, Rashmi Dewani, Director of Art X Company, to take the session forward. Rashmi, over to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and a warm welcome to everybody who has been here before, and a bigger warm welcome to all of you who've been coming here for the first time. Um, I'll open up by laying the ground uh, with some basic ground rules, just to give you a sense of what's going on and how things are going to proceed. Uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce the session a little bit. Uh, we started off thinking about how do we look at the concerns that the cultural festival sector has faced given the COVID-19 crisis. For the next few webinars, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Our last session was on financial health management, if some of you had had a chance to attend it. This session, uh, we decided to move and look at the lens of cultural festivals from the perspective of the individual, the freelancer, the gig worker, the consultant, uh, the artist as well. Um, gig working as a construct is relatively new in the last couple of decades in particular. Um, I mean, unlike our parents, we don't do, uh, we don't really have full-time jobs uh, to the extent as it used to be, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, and this has been exacerbated by various reasons such as technology affords uh, for us to work from anywhere, uh, market needs, lifestyle choices of this particular generation of the workforce. The culture sector also is quite unique in the sense it survives on small clusters of teams. And with the mushrooming of the cultural sector, you've seen a range of small teams and small organizations and individuals who've been sustaining and shaping the sector in multiple ways. Uh, many cultural festivals have been employing, employing gig workers when you're talking about designers, uh, video assistants, photographers, artist managers, uh, and typically you would have any, anywhere between five to 15 projects a year that you could do, much of it coming from the festival space. So what happened with COVID-19? Um, festivals were canceled, they were postponed, they were shelved. Gig workers emerged as one of the hardest hit communities. And we felt that we need to start uh, engaging with the needs of this community, along with, of course, speaking to um, cultural festival leaders, which we have been doing. A lot of the discussions that have been happening have been top heavy, uh, which was needed at, at earlier uh, during lockdown 1.0, but we're already on lockdown 4.0. And we need to start looking at uh, accessing voices from across the community. Um, that's what brings us to this webinar. We are going to look at uh, putting a spotlight on you and um, look at how we can collectively paint a picture for the future of gig workers. The two big areas that we're going to address, the two big questions we're going to address is what are my concerns as a gig economy worker and what does the future of cultural festivals look like uh, for the gig economy worker? In order to address this question, we felt we needed to have a multifaceted panel that doesn't just look at um, you know, the needs of the gig worker in terms of where do I get my next job or how do I pivot in these times, but also look at your legal rights and your mental health. Um, and hence, all our panelists here today are going to be able to respond to you in that holistic totality of engaging with this crisis for which we really have no playbook uh, to work with. So what did we do? Um, instead of just coming up with a bunch of questions, we reached out to the community and we actually have 10 fantastic videos from creative professionals who have given us um, their testimonials of what is it that they're dealing with, what are their concerns, and how have they managed to navigate these concerns. And we're going to be opening this up, session up with those videos and sharing those videos, those voices with you, 
and requesting all our panelists to respond to those voices, those concerns. So in that sense, um, this is not just, again, a, a top view of how the situation is, but a responsive view of what do we need to do while dealing with the very real concerns that you have. Um, just a few ground rules. You can see the chat window on your right. Please, please make a note of that. We will be putting up our instructions, our bios, our links, uh, relevant links all up there. Feel free to click on them, copy them, uh, screenshot them if you, if you must uh, to, to get the traction just so that we're able to save time on, uh, and focus more on the discussion. We also have a Q&A box, as you can see, and that box is very important for you you can ask questions to a panel using the box. My request is to, when you're asking a question, try and address it to a specific panelist so we can call them upon when we're asking your question live. Um, aside from that, if they do have time and they can manage, they may also respond to your question through the Q&A box. So please address it to the specific panel or to anyone generally if you wish to address them. Um, we are also going to uh, ensure that we try and take as many questions as possible, but it may not be able to address all the questions. We'll try our level best to follow up, uh, post this webinar and try and get the responses to you. At various points, you'll be asked to respond by a show of hands or by responding to a poll. Request you to please click on the poll so that we are able to get a sense of, you know, what you think about this session and if there's anything else that you may need. I know that a lot of you have not been able to join us on Zoom today. Uh, there continue to be crazy concerns around technology that we're trying to move around and make sense of. Uh, and hence, one of the reasons why we are hosting this session on insider.in to ensure additional you know, privacy controls. For those of you who've not been able to join us on Zoom, please check out our Facebook page. This session is being live streamed on the page. So if you're not able to get on Zoom, get onto the page, ask us questions there. We have a team looking at the responses on the page and we will be taking your questions as we move on. Um, please, please, please do tag us if you can and use the hashtag festivals for future so that we're able to track them and track any comments and questions that you may have and get back to you on various other channels. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. You can choose whatever platform you want and of course also Instagram. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to open the session up and uh, start with our first set of videos. Over to you, team. Hi, my name is Shalini Madwana, and I have been working as an independent arts consultant and arts educator for about the last two years. Um, my work has been a lot of um, events and programming across uh, museums, galleries, sometimes also with the ad hoc um, tourism industry, they're working a lot at heritage sites. Um, what this has done is uh, during the lockdown made me realize that um, independent consultants and gig workers, they uh, are the first ones to actually uh, be taken out of any kind of um, budget, due to any budgetary constraints, which a lot of organizations of course have. Secondly, I think one of the bigger challenges which uh, we're all navigating is that uh, the cultural sector overall is uh, fairly unorganized. So there is no centralized source for all of us that are not in um, salary jobs to be able to uh, use certain resources or have a recourse in any way. And uh, a challenge that has been navigated to an extent by me is... Uh, a collaboration I had with the, the NGO Bunj, where I've contributed my time and skills in lieu of uh, art professionals and creative professionals donating to Bunj, contributing to Bunj. And uh, we've had sessions which are about portfolio reviews, um, just a lot of uh, feedback on top in terms of artistic practice, um, editing, proofreading. So that's, that's a way that I've kind of been able to um, contribute some efforts at a time like this. So that's kind of where I'm at, um, as are probably many others in the gig economy. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Hi, my name is Sheena Khalid and I am a storyteller and a theater artist based in Bombay. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of challenges and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, which is very scary. 
um, being a storyteller and a theater artist because my line of work requires all of the things that are prohibited during this time. So the challenges that I have faced have been in transitioning my work uh, into the online medium. A lot of my income, even prior to that, a lot of my income in general comes from workshops that I conduct, uh, be it public speaking, be it storytelling, uh, storytelling workshops. So I am now in the process of uh, taking these modules, which I have developed over time, and uh, trying to figure out how I can best adapt them for an online platform, be it Zoom or, or, or whatever. Um, I think that it is it is doable. It is just it's, it's requiring a lot of rewiring and just looking at it from another kind of lens. And uh, I am hoping that within the next week I will be able to launch a program. Uh, one of the things that I am taking as positive with this uh, with the fact that it's going to be online is that my reach will be wider. So I will normally when I have a workshop I can maybe accommodate. Eight is eight is a high number. If it's a public speaking workshop, eight people. If it's a storytelling workshop, around uh, fifteen to twenty people. This is when I hold them privately, not affiliated with any organization. So I am hoping, though, once I take this online, that I will be able to reach a, a larger group and have um, a larger amount of participants in the workshop. Thank you for that. Uh, Yadu and Dipti, um, may I have our panelists um, turn their videos on, please? There we are. Hi. Hi, Rashmi. Great, fantastic. Hi, Atul. Hi, Rebecca, Neha, Priyanka. Good to have Hi. you here. Great. Okay, so. Um, I mean, these videos, even when we were getting them, and I know we've had some of these conversations before, uh, we felt that you know, while there are concerns, um, the people we spoke to are trying to make sense of what's going on, but there are still constraints despite that, right? And the, there is no measure of success because like I mentioned earlier, there's no playbook. So one of my first questions that I have for all of you in this case in particular is technology. Uh, uh, it's always been both a barrier and a boon for most people. And it appears even from, from the way uh, both of them, even despite them having, you know, being able to navigate to a certain extent, are thinking about how to look at technology, how to use it to pivot. So my first question is to you all about, you know, what, what do you think that, especially as an individual who has, who's responsible for their own learning, their own growth, their own way of scoping opportunity, how should they look at technolo technologically, technology, both, both philosophically, but also from a practical point of view? Who first? You seem to be smiling, so I'll get you to go first. <laughs> no, I was just saying who first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one, one of the points that I think uh, this uh, conversation is going to bring out is the fact that we all need to start collaborating and start working with other people far more than we have. Because while it is true that certain people will skill up in terms of using technology, it's going to be way beyond the most people. So you're not going to be able to do a lot of stuff that someone who's more conversant with technology will do. So I think the idea would be to reach out to people, which also generates more work for people in this lockdown who are more proficient in certain areas. Okay. Would anybody else like to? Yeah, yeah that's me. So I, I can, sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you go, Priyanka. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so Rashmi, I can add to that, I think, and uh, it's interesting because um, from my point of view, I actually face a lot of technology-related questions, and even more so the last few weeks that we've been in this lockdown, um, a simple thing gradually seeing the shift to more online consoles, more live, and just like this panel right now that we're doing, right? And um, I think with that uh, comes the challenges of technology. A lot of times people are confused or puzzled about what can I, what is permissible and not permissible on a platform, right? And this is ranging from just plain simple infringement issues 
to even things that are more serious like uh, you know is your content prejudicial is it defamatory online bullying harassment you know we've seen a lot of the recent controversy um, as far as the online social media platforms and influencers are concerned so i think with that we obviously realize that technology a of course is helping us to adapt and transition in this challenging time to the live economy and this is something that i so you have to get realize on it is that it makes you self reliant there are a lot of tools that are in built take something very simple uh, legal advice right a lot of times and in normal circumstances if you want to take an action for infringement or if you want to report something that you feel is prejudicial you know you're thinking that oh i need to probably go get counsel i need to file a formal proceeding and so on and so forth but today given technology given the tools that almost every platform makes available to you you could literally do it your own context you have a lot of digital distribution services right so you are no longer reliant on um, an entity or a third party to help you communicate your works to everybody and whatever this could be whether it's your story it's your music so you have those sort of tools that are available so i think more so than ever with seeing technology play a large part and i think atul is right that of course it requires some amount some degree of collaboration because not everyone is necessarily tech savvy or conversant with technology and at the same time it's not necessary that everyone has a certain online following so i think that spread the collaborative and the uh comes into play great thanks for that priyanka i think i got most of it but your network was a bit more than a bit shaky so i and i know that i missed a bit so i'm i'm just going to try and recap from what i understood but uh, essentially um, you have spoken about the fact that um, there are concerns around legal rights oh, of content so <laughs> that's okay we already established the barriers and the boons of technology as a flag <laughs> for our attendees so we know that that could be a concern but i'll i'll try and capture as much as much as i gathered and i'll i'll be i'll bring rebecca in for for the next part but um, essentially from a legal point of view you mentioned that um, content in itself there are concerns around it especially when you're sharing and creating where there are you know boundaries around what is permissible what is not permissible um you know issues of defamation and stuff which is one area of concern and the second is why uh, rights violations uh, which is another area of concern technology also however makes that easy to deal with to a certain extent um but uh, legal advice is key in this case and and collaboration is one way to go to think about how do you make sense of this universe and take advice where needed uh, through people who actually may have more uh, understanding of the space than you do so collaboration seems to be a very key theme emerging but a uh, bang on 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 the legal aspects which you know as a gig worker without having this context you may not even think about uh, but rebecca just to bring you in pull you in uh, would love to get your response on this first question thank you very much rashmi and a uh, huge thanks to shalini and setara for sharing their thoughts with us i thought so beautifully and so honestly um yeah i mean i also think that priyanka really covered off some of the legal problems that we we or, or the legal questions rather than problems with, with some of this digital technology um and personally I, i mean i really do understand the fear that people may have of some of the difficulties of dealing with digital technology however i take huge amounts of relief in some ways from the last 9 weeks and the way in which people have learned very quickly to navigate platforms complicated platforms um and becoming incredibly fluent and and fluent on them um so i, I don't know about you guys there in india but to to such an extent in fact we're starting to see huge creativity around these digital platforms and how many parties zoom parties have we all been to in the last couple of weeks how many gatherings and quizzes and online discussions have there been and you know at the beginning it was quite stilted and quite you know kind of yeah, everybody using it correctly but i actually have seen you know enormous amounts of creativity 
creeping in you know so so I went to a party that had costumes and music and you know and um that people were making up games or repurposing games that would they'd normally play in the, in the analog space for the digital space so huge creativity um, and I just sorry I just want to really touch on one thing perhaps unsurprisingly um I'm I'm gonna kind of just uh, refer to a Shakespearean uh, reference here. I did spend a lot of time working for the RSC um, and I just keep thinking about um, William Shakespeare, you know, and there he is, your man, you know, he, he kind of, he starts to embrace technology very, very soon in his, his career. Um, and the biggest and the best technology at his time was the, the kind of Jacobean mask, if you like, the, the kind of, that is the glitzy, glamorous kind of high-end sort of technology that was available to him um, and so at the end of as you like it um, i think we see a kind of mask being brought in that is kind of it, it follows the rules it's it's brilliant um, and and it, it's impactful but by 10 years later by the time we get to the tempest there's another mask at the end of that and this mask is totally nuts it completely subverts the form it it turns it upside down it you know it plays with it in amazing ways and I think that's what we're going to see with, with digital technology during this crisis. I think we're going to see people, first of all, learning, you know, building on what they already know and then really recreating it. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. So uh, the two things that you spoke about, and again, before I bring Neha in, is uh, the potential to have enormous amounts of creativity. And, uh, and thank you for bringing this up, the whole definition of technology. Right now we're thinking of technology only as digital technology, but I just actually pulled up the definition of technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in an industry. And if we just take a step back and think about the fact that technology is not just a computer uh, or the internet, suddenly, especially for artists, suddenly, uh, you know, and, and creative professionals, a new world opens up on the, about the way you look at this idea of technology. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for bringing that. Neha, uh, one of the things when, we, when we're dealing with technology, uh, aside from the excitement and the creativity around it, is also fatigue. And uh, that's something that people are in, you know, increasingly uh, thinking about, that how can we, A, translate live experience online, B, would it get too much from an audience experience point of view? But when you're talking about a creator who thrives, survives, draws identity from the idea of live, how should they respond to technology? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a very interesting question in a very interesting time because I think it's about uh, our ability to reinvent and uh, uh, sort of reinstate the, the world around us and how we interact with it. And, you know, I, I'm amazed when I look at children in this lockdown situation um, and how quickly they're able to adapt. Uh, and I think about the, the sort of habits and conditioning and almost sort of established whether it's, whether it's baggage or a certain way of doing a certain thing to get to a certain outcome, the, the framing of life as we have applied over the last few decades of our life is really what our, perhaps our challenge and our handicap might be. And the ability to sort of recognize that and then say, all right, you know, it's, it's a new world and this is now the new normal, not for a, not an event in a, a month or a, a week, but you know, this is how it might be for a long time. How do we then sort of reconnect with the world? If we were to look at it from a clean slate, it might become easier. So that's sort of my first little point there. Um, and then you don't look at technology as separate from our day-to-day -day lives anyways, right? It's just that what we want to be able to do is the medium of interaction with the world. And therefore we're slightly out of our comfort zone because it's via a medium, right? That is, that is new and it kind of feels like an interruption or something in the way. Um, if we had always connected this way, we would never know any other. Right? Uh, and so I'm almost suggesting from a, from a mental conditioning perspective, uh, our ability to feel more connected, feel more able uh, and feel more creative can come from not looking at something as a new barrier, but just something as a way of life. Right? Um, I, I love the point around partnerships and collaboration and the fact that different people have different strengths and the arts community, I mean, right back from when I started the art fair in 2008, there, there have been challenges around sort of collaboration and partnerships and organizing associations. But the more that that happens and cohorts develop, 
where different people can support each other, the better it is, right? Um, and I think at the end of it, it's our ability to adapt and transform. And who better than the arts community uh, to show the way for others uh, to do that, right? I almost feel like there are a lot of other sectors I can think of who really don't know because they've never dealt with anything other than what they're you know, sort of used to dealing with. So I almost feel like the artist, artistic community can take a step forward and almost lead the way in showing how to adapt to this new normal and, and have an influencing effect on other communities and other sectors as well. Thank you for that. So it, it's like uh, starting with a clean slate and talking about a mental sort of you know, remapping, uh, I think it's more like learning a language, as, as you also said, right? Like you sort of think of it as learning a language. It has grammar, it has rules, and it's not that difficult. And perhaps that's a better way to, to look at dealing with technology. Uh, and you've got buddies with, uh, as collaborators who can help you make sense of, of what this universe could do and produce. But I, one of the other things that I picked up, which you sort of you know, explicitly also stated is just we, we already have the resilience gene in some sense as the creative community and we should just trust that and work with that while dealing with, with tech. I, I can see that Priyanka has dropped off. I hope the team's trying to get her back on. But while we bring her back on, just you know, moving a little bit away. So if, you, if you're able to look at technology with these lenses of uh, you know, the potential for huge creativity, learning a new language, looking at collaboration. Oh, hi, Priyanka, you're there. Okay, I think you're probably on uh, off video, so. We, we, I, I thought you weren't there. Okay, got it. Hi, again. Um, so as, as I was saying, just to sort of take these themes further about, you know, the fact that we're also resilient and we can reinvent, how should they be looking at pivoting at this time with everything that's going on, all the uncertainty? Um, and, and again, I, I want to bring this theme up later in the session as well, but just as a, as a starting point, where's the beginning point for this pivot? Uh, and we'll get deeper into the strategies of pivoting, but from any, anyone, it doesn't have to be all of you, but anyone who'd like to go here. I mean, I'm happy to kick off because uh, in a way, I, I'm, I'm now reminded of uh, August of 2008 and, um, and not the best time to start an art fair when Lehman Brothers came crashing down uh, and the world went into a big sort of financial recession. And I remember uh, just this idea of saying who who would think about an art fair in that context and you know we were sort of pivoting the the creative industries at that point or uh, to say that look there is the possibility of setting something like this up and and so in a way so somebody has to just try right so a lot of it is about experimenting right uh, and I think it's uh, our ability to adapt and learn very quickly unlearn very quickly too um, and be able to shift between different formats and experiments is really sort of the trick uh, the one catch that is there is, you know, being, being clear what you're trying to cater to. So some of us in the uh, constrained by um, our need to deliver to an audience or our need to financially support ourselves or our need to find creative expression are not sure what we're, the choices we're making are based on what, right? Uh, and I think there, there's a delicate balance between the things that give you fulfillment and that are true to your artistic expression and the things that a medium or an audience uh, across that medium is able to consume at the present moment. And again, reconciling with that and helping uh, using that parameter to make the right choices is really something that will land us in whatever our sweet spot is uh, as a balance, right? So that's sort of one little uh, uh, sort of approach I would like to suggest. Hi. Yeah, Nihal, I think that, that, you know, you put it really beautifully there and I, and I, and I agree that's really important. And I, I think it's also important that the artists don't blindly sort of follow technology, but instead get ahead of it and play with it. I thought, um, Rashmi, that your analogy with learning the language is, is a really important one that actually, you know, you know what it's like when you're learning the language. At first, it's kind of, it's really difficult and you can't get your brain to work in the same way. But but you, by just trying, by saying it out loud, by, you know, having a go, essentially, you get better at it. And I, and I think that, um, that, that, that technology can work for us as artists and as, as makers of art, you know, I think it, and that's the way around it should be. Because the other way around, where we're desperately trying to keep up with it, is very anxious making, which we don't need at this time, I think.
if nobody else i'll just proceed to the next round atul please so, yes. yeah so uh, mm-hmm. I, you know you you young people use a lot of fancy words which i don't understand so what exactly do you mean by pivoting that's why i was keeping quiet um i think it's just um like learning a new language just knowing what your tools are but using them to sl- move in a slightly different direction because your goalposts have changed so um so, yeah. you know i i think when it comes from the creative community um artists being artistically bent um i think they should know where they want to go uh, if you heard about the concert that happened in denmark at the drive in right they went in there to do a live gig and they realized that there was a lockdown and they couldn't do it so they had 500 cars in there everyone sitting in their cars communicating with the artists uh, through zoom and uh, the concert being broadcast on an fm radio station right so he knew he wanted to play he probably didn't know what the technology was someone came in and said hey you know what we can do it on fm radio you can do it on zoom uh, that was a great example um then we had uh, the fortnite gig with uh, travis scott which has broken all kinds of records um 28 million people almost uh, online uh the gaming company knew that they wanted to do a concert travis scott wanted to do a concert they got together and did the business that's why i made the point about uh, collaborations so i think um, you know your point about it's a language you need to understand the language yes people need to understand the language but i think from the artistic point of view i think it really boils down to what the artist wants and honestly i speak from the music industry because i don't know any other industry but if the artist knows what he wants he can do it in fact over here i must mention my friend baba sagal everyone uh, sniggers a lot in 1992 the man was one of the first pop superstars that we had uh, he vanished for a long time he's back again larger than life and he's just set up a website which is uh, i think streets ahead of what any other artist has done he's asking for subscriptions he's selling merchandise in two days he sold 250 t-shirts so you know he knows what he wants he got some kids from hyderabad to do the technology for him and uh, wait and watch you know he's a thought leader thank you for that atul and um, you know just to sort of uh, what was what was so amazing about the three of you and what you shared is one key theme that i'm picking up is the choices we make uh, and i feel like it somewhere has to do with goals and uh, you know they're having a sense of where do you want to head and knowing what what you want um which is which is easier so if you just put down okay i want to make uh, at least the money that i was making half the money that i was making pre lockdown how can i get there and that may perhaps reduce the anxiety um and the other thing that you also and as as uh, atul you said there are ways of doing it as long as you know what you're doing um the other thing that rebecca picked up on which i thought was very interesting was um the, the tech feeling that you need to know the tech in itself will cause that anxiety but we've actually discussed tech in quite detail earlier on because you know there are ways to navigate through that as well so not to be fearful of tech but with this i'd like to lead us into the second set of videos because they actually deal with exactly that what if you have a mental block what if you are paralyzed what if you don't know how to move despite knowing tech and having some sense of the goals where do we go from there so if we can have the team bring up uh, the next set of videos please thank you Hi, I'm Sitara Chawla. I'm here to talk about my challenges that I've been facing during the COVID-19 lockdown. One of the biggest challenges for me as a gig worker has just been the sense of insecurity of not knowing when my um, field of work is going to resume and when I'm going to be able to um, start taking on projects for not just this year but the next year and the year after that. It's it's the long-term sense of insecurity that has probably been the most challenging. One of the things that I'm really proud of having accomplished is the pivot that the organization Pulse Society that I work with had managed to do in the first weeks of the lockdown. We transformed our physical exhibition plan into an online exhibition, but it was more of a game that was meant to be engaging for participants and meant to give people a sense of community. Uh, we did that with the Aragidas Art Fair, and I think that was a really exciting experience, not just for me independently, but for us as a group, and to do something collective and to do something collaboratively. One of the 
things that I have not been very successful at is staying motivated on a daily basis. I think I feel quite lonely and I feel sometimes um, at a loss of what to do next and where to look for directions. I find myself getting very easily distracted and yeah, staying motivated is really hard. everyone. Um, thank you to the Artex team for inviting me here to share my experiences uh, today. As someone who works in the space of education and public engagement with museum spaces, art galleries, urban histories, most of my work was at an absolute standstill in March. After um, an initial period of taking stock, I think what I was able to do was to make a digital shift mentally. And uh, one of the ways in which I have navigated this period or this challenge was beginning to think about how I can put events and programs online. Uh, so not just, you know, recreate the same programming that I would try to do in person, but create brand new programming that could work for an international audience. Um, so I've been quite happy with how that's been going so far. On the other hand, if I were to think of a, a challenge or a weakness that I'm facing now, it is, um, you know, perhaps that it's going too slowly. Uh, and um, yeah, I've definitely been facing issues with uh, knowing the kind of technologies that are out there and how to use them. So progress is slow. And also uh, the other thing is a little bit more personal, but I think it does have an impact that I don't have the luxury of time that I earlier did, uh, simply because I have two kids below the age of five now with me full time. And so, um, you know, these are the, some of the sort of obstacles in my path to going faster. Uh, but what I am really excited about is the, um, you know, is that I know that even once we're in a post COVID world, that uh, what I can offer digitally can continue alongside what I'm doing in person in Mumbai. So that's really quite exciting. And um, yeah, uh, I'm, again, thank you for inviting me here and I look forward to learning more from the webinar. So if Alicia and Sitara there again, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Earlier on, we had Charlene um, and, um, and Sheena, both of whom are from visual arts and theater respectively. This time we had Sitara uh, who's again from visual arts and uh, Alicia, who's from the space of heritage, uh, just to give you a, a context of the kind of genres that we're talking about. But just to pick up on this theme, one of the key things is the sense of uncertainty around. Uh, and that is coupled with uh, a completely uh, different, you know, environment has shifted. You know, you're used to flying uh, with wings uh, before lockdown and suddenly you ask, you're being asked to do the same thing or something slightly different, but underwater. So in this context of environment shifting, there is a, a lot of uncertainty. Let's put it out there right at the very beginning that uh, freelancers, consultants in India are not recognized as, as in any formal way. And I know Priyanka, we have a question around legal, so we'll bring this up uh, after the third set of videos. But there is, uh, we, we don't, yeah. we're not recognized. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, we don't have uh, insurance packages. So the levels of vulnerability yeah. are very, very high. Uh, at the same time, it's not like we're individuals who are uncoupled and without children. So there are concerns around managing the home, managing children, and all of this, I'm sure, adds to an enormous amount of mental health concerns. Um, so I'd like, I'd love for you to, all of you actually, to address this from your perspectives, beginning with Neha, uh, particularly because, you know, you've dealt with this yourself as a creative professional for about 10 years and now as a mental health, uh, you know, co-founder of a mental health company. Sure. Um, I mean, I think just one of the things I picked up from the, the video last, the last video we saw was um, around the idea of also having a level playing field. I mean, we're looking at this as a negative and as a barrier, but if you look, if you look at the world before, right, uh, there was a lot of advantages for artists who had the resources, who had the physical spaces, who had the advantage of some backing or the other uh, versus those that didn't. Uh, and the, the, it was not a level playing field in many ways. And there was great talent that was hidden um, and couldn't reach a, a far and wide audience, which is actually very enabled in this environment. So if you think about the opportunity of a new level playing field where you're not facing a lot of the financial constraints that you faced in the physical environment, right? I mean, when we, when we spent sort of multi-million dollars trying to build art fairs and build other festivals and all of those things cost a lot of money. 
and to think about a direct to you know artist to viewer uh, experience without a lot of those sort of logistical constraints and difficulties you condense things in terms of time um, you increase the connection between the artist and the direct the end audience you know it's, it can be instant it can be quicker it can be ongoing uh, there is a longevity to it that the formats allow on tech that is before and after so i think that we have to look at the advantages and the positive that this current environment is creating for us if we're willing to see it that way um and so that's sort of one mental shift that i you know i would i would like us to sort of explore and when you look at it from a mental health perspective look all of this is is hard when you're in a sector that is fragmented that does not have uh, the the legal framework and the right policy support and insurances and a sector that doesn't often collaborate as well or or lack some of the infrastructure it sounds like where do i start right and we've all been there um i've been there with you know at i at a time when i was uh, uh, sort of heavily engaging in the creative industries was also a time when i was dealing with a lot of mental health issues very closely in my own family um i've seen three decades of psychosis uh, in my immediate family uh, and even though we're rehabilitated today it's been a very difficult uh, term all of that uh, during all of that period and i've then pivoted to saying you know i'm after after sort of um, selling the art fair i actually moved on to setting up mental health organizations and partnering with dr amit malik actually at inner r which is a digital mental health platform because i recognize how important uh, mental health is and the artistic community is a big inspiration for that um arts is a big uh, therapeutic medium as well so you know we we as the artistic community are, are very lucky uh, to have the medium of the arts uh, to be able to express ourselves to be able to release um and and equally uh, i recognize that a lot of people in this community actually struggle uh, with a lot of those issues and and so whether it's different levels of uh, it's not just covid related right we have our own life you know dealing with children dealing with marriage dealing with work from home um health anxieties I and mean, we've we're looking at data across our platform from 100 different cities uh, across india and uh, and we can see from tier 2 tier 3 india as well people reporting back about a whole host of sort of new conditions and new problems that they didn't have earlier and also an amplification of the existing problems so if you ask yourself how am i going to start and how am i going to deal with it i think it's it's about not not making it this one big mountain of a task but doing it bite size dealing with it every day expressing bit by bit connecting all the time and literally just sort of bringing it home and constantly ensuring that your connection with yourself is not broken uh, and when it is then reaching out and getting the help it could be in the family it could be uh, through helplines it could be through i mean we have a self help platform for instance with 600000 people on it there's about 10 12000 people on it every day um and we have a we have a counseling line with 150 therapists they are today counseling in seven or eight local languages and we've had a shoot a big sort of a shooting up of the usage both on the therapy and and on the digital self help so we know people need help and i just want to i just want to reiterate how important it is uh, to seek that help and actually how how quickly you may find that just with a little bit of intervention you can actually get on and get by and 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 actually really flourish thank you so much neha for sharing that and also sharing you know your own motivations for being in this space uh, really appreciate it uh, so two things that you pointed out very clearly is the frame looking at the the opportunities that this space presents as a living level playing field that's i think that's a great way to look at it um, i know that for me for instance i've never learned i've never done chapatis but now 1 o'clock is chapati time so i don't take calls at 1 o'clock and i mean i i tell that to everybody it doesn't matter whether it's a client or you know an employee or anybody so it's about uh, it gives us an opportunity to set those boundaries new boundaries that work for us as opposed to working for the mainstream or the majority in some sense so i think that's that's an excellent way to look at it uh, but the other thing that that you spoke about is um, you know bite sized not losing touch with oneself but also knowing when to seek help um i want to shift the lens here to atul and rebecca if you could you know you you you're dealing with artists on a daily basis and this is something that i have noticed working with several genres as well because our our sectors tend to be so vulnerable and because artists also and the creative community also tends to be so sensitive what are the challenges of dealing with these these boundaries and knowing for sure when to stop when to seek for help uh 
you know, the concerns around it, you know, am I, am I someone who is uh, doing something wrong by seeking help? Is something wrong with me? Other questions that typically tend to come up. So how do you suggest dealing with those very basic essentialist concerns? Ladies first. Thank you, Atul. Um, I don't know if Priyanka is with us or not. I'll, I'll go for now. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you um, to Alicia and Sitara there for, for bringing these issues to us. And, and I think that um, what Niha said is absolutely true in the UK as well. It's not a, I mean, it's a different, not a level playing field, but it isn't a level playing field here either. Um, and I, I think one of the biggest issues that we face still um, in, in India and in the UK is a kind of stigma around mental health. And therefore, I think it's incredibly important that the arts lead the way in talking about it, in making sure that we, we do openly talk about the issues in our own families and, and so on. And, and I certainly try to do that, um, you know, in, in relation to this subject. Um, I think I think also that um, if we just go back to to what what is common amongst artists, I think there is a, a real desire amongst, amongst artists to, if you like, capture a larger slice of the truth through their art. And I think this is really important. And if you look at Picasso, for example, he did this by painting a face with several noses and eyes on it, yeah, because he thought that that was more truthful than just painting a face. And, and you know, to come back to Shakespeare again, I think he did it through recognising that man or woman is both alive, um, whilst at the time, the same time being incredibly and intensely in the invisible world of his thoughts and his feelings. And I think as artists, you know, as the best artists, then what we try to do is we try to represent both of those things simultaneously. Um, and, you know, we, we try to, to see the, the look on somebody's face, but also the vibrations of their brain, you know, quite often in, in how we present our art. And, and so therefore, artists trying to create this, I think, um, in, in mental health terms, I think it's incredibly complex and difficult. Um, because they are trying to present both the inside and the outside of, of, of the world. And during something huge and overwhelming like a pandemic, okay, this is like enormous, you know, because they're trying to, to put that out there and, and it's really difficult and it can trigger all sorts of negative feelings. So I think just in the making of art, we, it is incredibly important to, to, to practice self-care. You know, we can only go on for so long, I think, um, exploring these big questions and, 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 and feeling the impact that they have on us and perhaps on our families as well as we, as we explore them. Um, that can only, that, that, that's like, you know, trying to keep um, a lid on all of that, I think, is, is very difficult and it can quite easily frighten ourselves and our artists. And, and, and before long, what happens is that lid is going to blow off, I think, and that will create all sorts of issues. I think it's really important to if we can, to recognise when our lid is about to blow off, if you like, so that we stop that happening. But also, if it does happen, to stop and to deal with that, not to try and carry on through, you know, through it. I think to stop, to reflect, to be with it for a while, to, you know, to, to help each other through it, I think is really important. Thanks. Thanks for that. And Atul, in your response, if you could also cover, you know, self-care is, is one thing, but how do you get yourself out of bed? How do you say, I'm going to start work at 10 a.m.? How do you deal with motivation? If you could cover that in your response, that would be great as well. Um, okay, so in a, uh, the first thing is, and uh, you know, to me, Neha is the most important person on this panel, because the minute uh, someone goes and tells their parents that my career choice is going to be musician, and I'm sure that's true for the other arts, the folks turn around, the first question is, are you nuts? Right. That's a very, very common refrain. And I think that really says it all about the arts, uh, you know, segment. So anyone who's choosing this career, number one, has to be mentally very strong. And uh, I must mention over here that uh, I've always been very concerned about the fact that nobody conducts music business courses where they teach music. Right. You don't get to hear of music business courses in India. And part of that most critically would be mental health. The only person I know who's actually doing this is Ritnika Nayan, 
who uh, does uh, music make, music gets me higher so she does she does a great job she's been talking about mental health for a long time but there are a lot of places now that are offering music courses and i think one of the first things you have to teach uh, people who are getting into the arts especially musicians is mental resilience you know which brings me to my second point that um, yes covid crisis yes lockdown so no regular work but when you chose this career you knew you would not have work every day so covid is is uh, you know is, is maybe um, increasing that uh, that uh, sense of fear what is fear fear is basically you don't know what's going to happen that's what fear is right if you conquer that right and you say okay i accept the fact and i think there are enough and more people who said there's nothing going to happen as far as gigs are concerned till the end of december for sure some people have said till the end of next year so my advice to all musicians fine let's assume till end 2021 you're not going to get any gigs on the ground accept that first and you've got rid of a lot of fear what will happen what will not happen so then you'll start planning for what you're actually going to do and there was a very valid point that sam told me a, a couple of days ago which was that look how your expenses have come down living in a lockdown situation right if yesterday your household expenses were let's say a lakh of rupees they've probably dropped to about 25000 rupees today because you're not traveling you're not eating out etc you know so you have to first accept the situation then you've got to turn around and say fine for survival i need so much money okay if you know that aren't you going to be motivated to go out there and get it you can see the goal post the problem is when you can't see the goal post i think that's really the issue to my mind thanks thanks for that atul um and actually uh, priyanka we j- i just want to play the next video before i uh before i uh, you know bring you on because rather than getting you to answer at this point the question that i i do want you to respond to as soon as we play the next video to begin with is um as atul has said you know you accept it and you say okay this is my fear i may not get set income for the next 6 months or even 8 months what does that mean from a legal recourse point of view how can you look at things like recovery how can you look at things you know all of those concerns how do you deal with that uncertainty from what potentially the law has to offer and i'll just i'll just make you like hold on for just a couple of more minutes before we put the next video for context thank you over to you team hi i've been a musician for the last 10 years 11 years actually and i've been playing drums for about 14 years and playing music and playing live gigs has pretty much been the source of my main income for the last seven eight years man like that's all i've done and uh, uh last year i moved i moved to bases i'm actually from delhi and i moved to bombay spent a year in bombay working and picking up uh, production gigs and all sorts of other session related gigs because i wanted to expand and not just play drums and you know um uh, do a little bit of production stuff but because of covid and stuff <clears throat> since this has started everything's completely dried up you know uh, it's never happened i mean we always used to have off seasons uh, and stuff uh, every year right like during the summer but uh, at least during the summer a lot of gigs would get booked uh, for the season you know for the next coming season but this time it just feels like it's so unpredictable it, nobody knows what's going to happen and i actually will have to move back to my hometown because which is delhi because uh, i can't afford to live in bombay anymore it's it's just i mean the rent you have to pay rent and stuff and the overhead costs are quite high and stuff so yeah man uh, being during these covid times we have to make these uh, drastic calls and rethink the whole scenario so that was an audio recording that we had um the, the speaker preferred not to share his name or his identity and we respected that and hence requested him to send a audio recording uh we will now be moving on to the video so this is in hindi and but subtitled hello everyone 
my name is jitendra bore my company name is sound bites i'm based from mumbai mera business jo hai wo industry mein touring sound light trust led wall ka hai main live concert karta hu live band fashion show wedding show exhibition conference product launch political rally dj light tights इन सब के लिए मैं इंडोर और आउटडोर इक्विपमेंट प्रोवाइड करता हूँ आफ्टर लॉकडाउन मेरे सारे कंफर्म बुकिंग जो थे वो सब कैंसिल हो गए अपकमिंग इवेंट तो कुछ भी नहीं है हाल फिलहाल अभी आने वाले दिनों में फोर्थ लॉकडाउन खत्म हो जाएगा उसके बाद और कुछ नया पता नहीं आगे क्या होने वाला टिल मार्च से मैंने मेरा वेर हाउस बंद किया है सत्रह तारीख से मार्च के 22 तारीख से मेरा ऑफिस बंद हो गया उसके बाद हम लोग घर पे बैठे जितने भी परमानेंट स्टाफ जो थे जो बॉम्बे के लोग हैं वो हैं आजू बाजू में लेकिन जो डेली बेसिस पे बुलाते हम लोग उन लोग उन सबको हम लोगों ने छुट्टी दे दी है ये सब बिहार से यूपी से या झारखंड से आते थे कम से कम ये दो महीने गए उसके बाद भी और पांच महीने काम नहीं जून जुलाई अगस्त सेप्टेम्बर वैसे भी बारिश की सीजन में कुछ काम नहीं होता है तो लेकिन वेयर हाउस का रेट ऑफिस का रेट व्हीकल रेट ई सैलरी ये सब एक्सपेंस चालू है मतलब आउट गोइंग तो है लेकिन इनकमिंग जीरो बिल्कुल जीरो क्लबों में जो इक्विपमेंट लगे उसमें भी कोई बिजनेस नहीं है मतलब क्लब ही बंद है सब सभी जगह पे कुछ भी मूवमेंट्स नहीं है इसके लिए हम लोग शांत बैठे हैं आने वाले दिनों के लिए हम लोग कैसे सर्वाइव कर सकते हैं ये सोच रहे हैं जो भी सेविंग थी वो खत्म होने के लिए आई है रोज नए नए चैलेंजेस आ रहे हैं बाकी के एक्सपेंस तो रोज के रोज चालू है मतलब सब कुछ बेसिकली जो दिन का अगर पकड़ते हैं खर्चा आप चालीस से पचास हजार दिन का खर्चा है अगर एक कंपनी चलाते हैं वो आधा हो गया आप पकड़िए पच्चीस हजार मतलब महीने का साढ़े सात लाख रुपए कैसे ये हमारा जाना है ही So, इन सब में हम लोगों को पता नहीं कैसे सर्वाइव कर रहे हैं हम लोग देख रहे हैं गवर्नमेंट हमारे लिए क्या प्रोवाइड कर रही है गवर्नमेंट के पास हमारे पास एमएसएमई का जो ऑप्शन है उसमें हम लोग रजिस्टर्ड है लेकिन उसमें भी अगर आपका कोई ई चालू है लोन चालू है उसके अगेंस्ट आपको ट्वेंटी परसेंट मिलेगा पर ई एम आई पे ई एम आई लोग लोग डाल रहे हैं उसके बाद आने वाले दिनों में अगर वेयर हाउस लॉकडाउन खुल भी गया तो चैलेंजेस बहुत सारे हैं इक्विपमेंट के ई एम आई है और स्टाफ की प्रॉब्लम्स है उसके बाद भी वर्किंग कैपिटल चाहिए आदमी स्टाफ की सैलरी कंपटीशन पेंडिंग ई एम आई अरेंज करना जो जो भी बैकलॉग है वो क्लियर करना और कोल्ड uh, रिकवरी जो होनी चाहिए वो चैलेंज आने वाले दुनिया के लिए हमारे पास है um thanks for that team uh, this was uh, particularly difficult for us to actually get from um are the people who we reached out to because um you can almost see the thought process that's that that uh, you know the concerns through the thought process that's coming out um and it's it was very easy for us to respond um uh, in an emotional way but we felt that priyanka just to bring you back on um let, let if we can break some of this down from a logical point of view from a legal point of view from a financial health point of view how would you say uh, jitu or the anonymous musician who shared his his concern with us how would you respond to them in terms of bite size way of dealing with deep uncertainties and concerns So um, that we actually had someone who shared their views from the point of view of you know being not a performer or an artist or someone who's you know in that sense on stage, but someone who's more behind the scenes, a part of a crew. And uh, you know, I've been facing this the last few weeks because out of the clients that we advise, we also work with a lot of key vendors in this space. 
fair. And for me, every time that someone mentions the gig economy, I feel that the economy is incomplete uh, unless you factor in this whole other demographic, which is really your workers behind the scenes, whether they're you know responsible for your skill set when you're on a set shooting, your spot boys, your spot dada, your light guys. And I think all for you know for the rest uh, for the artists, and I don't mean to sort of this discriminate or empathize with one group and not with the other, but I feel that at least for this one group, there is still an alternative that you adapt, you find a way to communicate your art or to connect with your audiences. But for this other group, that's really the, what, you know, some might call it the technical crew. Uh, there's, I mean, they, they are really hamstrung. And I think uh, I was thinking of a few days ago, we had a dialogue with the MSME minister um, on behalf of this entire group to sort of try and see what are the what are the initiatives that the government can take? Is there any help that can be forthcoming in, these, in this situation? And here's another interesting tidbit, right? Um, according to reports by uh, one of the big four, this entire industry, the live event industry, is presently at about 800,000 odd crores. It was slated to grow to 10,000 crores by 2021. Despite the lockdown, even recently, I read a Goldman Sachs report earlier today that still predicts a growth that is going to be close to this figure, right? The only reason to put these numbers in perspective is it gets me thinking that for an industry, for a sector that is this remunerative, uh, how is it that we're still so that, that the sector is still so unorganized still today? Um, you know, I know a lot of them are. Uh, we talk about the MSME vendors, which is uh, so just to give some of the other some context of MSME. These would be medium, small, micro enterprises, right? So a lot of the people, a lot of the businesses, especially in the event sector, you see are small businesses. They are often uh, led by a proprietor. In India, especially, you see that. Even some of the most key players, some of our biggest sounding like vendors today are not even registered as companies. They're a sole proprietorship. Some of the biggest um, you know, event management companies, talent management companies even, or uh, key vendors and the crew members are all uh, still set up as proprietorships, partnerships, can't tell the distinction between uh, being that or being a company. Uh, so also, I know we have the MSME Act, and like this gentleman rightly pointed out that yes, it's fine, there's a certain amount of consideration, but the flip side is, the way the MSME Act is constructed is, uh, coming, say, take a simple point of recovery, right? You're required to pay an MSME registered company within 45 days from the completion of services. Now, given how the event business works, there's obviously always a cash flow issue. So, you are reliant on your client to make payment. Once you have that, is it only then I'm going to be able to pass it on to, just to someone further? So even though the statute to protect this particular group of people has come up with a statutory timeline of 45 days, companies uh, or even at times people who are awaiting the services will just take a view that, listen, I'd rather not deal with an MSME vendor because there is no way I can commit to a payment within, 40, within a 45-day payment timeline. So I think this is how... Uh, even the law kind of fails because it's pointless putting in place statutes or regulations without understanding the ground reality of the business. And I think that's a large part of what hap what is happening today as far as the sector is concerned and the challenges that we face leave uh, in why it still remains largely unorganized. So I think the short point of all of this is yes, I think this has been a good wake up call for all of us to realize that there is scope and room for enormous policy and thought leadership to be put forward. There's a lot that can be done to revamp the sector. Uh, and of course, all of these are longer, uh, longer goals. But in the short, uh, in the short term itself, um, I think there, the alternative, there are enough, there are certain legal remedies that are still available. So for example, when we talk of recoveries, there's still nothing that stops you from reaching out to people, sending notices if you must, it, at times even initiating proceedings where you can warrant urgency. Uh, and courts are, even in this lockdown, listening to urgent matters where it is a question of someone's livelihood or there is, uh, you know, something absolutely pressing that makes an impact or negatively or prejudices your position, you can still move forward. So those legal remedies are always available. Uh, but other than that, I think it is really a good turning point for all of us to sit and think and perhaps come together to see how can this sector be made more organized to protect interests of not just one group, but a whole bunch of others that form part of the gig economy. Thanks, Priyanka. I may have to request you to uh, go off video because your voice is yeah. breaking. Essentially, this time it was much better than last time, but it just might Sorry. be. 
no no worries there you go thank you uh, but uh, you know i mean the big picture perspective was great to get and and thanks for for giving us this sense and i and i do realize actually uh, that a lot of companies are not registering themselves under msme precisely because of this however for the individual they are still going to be a sole proprietorship jitu was uh, an anomaly in our in our uh, larger set of videos because he runs uh, you know even though uh you know he's registered under msme he's still probably a sole proprietor and he has all these concerns about how to meet these costs so if not legally are there ways in which that you suggest that they can uh, ask for pending payments uh, are there tips that any of you and priyanka starting with you could give on uh things like recovery how do they look at meeting basic expenses what would be the logical step forward around these things uh could they perhaps take loans from friends and family what would you suggest uh you know to break out of this thought pattern that people people are dealing with that i don't know what to do i don't have any money when actually they may have recourses so yeah would be great to hear from you from an individual perspective as well on that front sure so rashmi two things that i want to sort of address there one is that look even though you may be a single person that owns a business it still does not mean that you need to be registered as a proprietorship you could still very much have a more formal corporate setup right even if it is as simple as forming an llp or a private limited company and the only reason that i sort of stress very often with clients especially with smaller businesses when it comes to their setup is that it adds a layer of protection as a proprietor you're always at all times going to be personally liable and when you're running a business there could be a zillion things that could that could go wrong right take again the example of this gentleman who uh, spoke to us who is a vendor uh he has a warehouse there could be a, you know a variety of mishaps that could happen with the warehouse or he has a whole bunch of uh laborers or daily wage workers that may be employed by him and imagine if there is something that happens uh an unfortunate incident either on one of his sets or during an event uh when you are set up as a proprietorship you're always going to be personally liable as opposed to being a company or being a more formal sort of corporate setup where you are recognized as a separate legal person in the eyes of law and it gives you that arms length distance from you being personally liable so that's one um and the other thing is addressing your query about what are the legal recourses or remedies that they have at this point of time well as uh, as a lawyer i must confess that one of the toughest things to do in this country um is uh, when it comes to money disputes or money claims right it is it has always been a challenge and it still remains a challenge uh having said that there are enough and more tools so one the simplest thing that someone can do is start by sending a notice for recovery of monies that's one at times you may have a check if your check bounces be quick to react and send a check bouncing notice under section 138 of the negotiable instruments act um if there is a company on the other end that is that's the person that is uh you know that owes you money and where you have dues to be recovered you can also approach the nclt you have now something called the ib code so if you have debts that are of a substantial amount i think the limit has been revised to above to about um to above a crore of rupees so you can even approach the national company law tribunal under the insolvency and bankruptcy code against corporate debtors so i think these are just some of the tools what is key here and i i say this across the board to a uh, talent and businesses is that you must react quickly and proactively a lot of times unfortunately we're just sort of sitting and thinking and you know wondering that oh my goodness i feel so helpless i don't know what to do i don't know where to start well start by just building communication address an email address that letter if you can't afford to go to a lawyer you just compose something and make sure that you're starting that paper trail that chain of communication with someone who owes you money so i think that's one and coming to the other more practical aspects of it as far as finances are concerned well that's that's you know a, perhaps a business person is better suited to to lend advice but yes i would say if there is a lack of an option then one has is going to have to turn to making borrowings getting some loans 
I know of some of them who've also collateralized uh, some heavy machinery and equipment to try and raise funds. Because on the one hand, till not so long ago, you also had government advisories in place that said that you mustn't fire, you know, do your best to not fire employees. And especially with gig workers. So a lot of them are also people who depend on daily wages, right? They're people who are just coming and doing your setup or are there behind the scenes. Uh, so yes, on the one hand, as a vendor, I would have the dilemma where I feel torn between, you know, I've got to make payroll. I don't want to deprive these persons off of their salaries because their livelihood and their families perhaps depend just on that income and that income alone. And on the other hand, I still have the burden of, you know, how do I go about making recoveries when there is absolutely no uh, events or business insight in the future. So I, I do sympathize because it is a very tricky position for them to be in. Thanks for that. And picking up from there again, when it comes to uh, loans and borrowings, um, Atul, I know that since you started off by the theme of collaboration, um, I know we've mentioned that there are organizations that have self-organized and have come together and have managed to pay salaries of people who are a part of those associations. Could you perhaps share that and you know, how could gig workers you know, perhaps come together in such ways? So just staying with the, the Jitu Morya story and what Priyanka was talking about, uh, a lot of people are unaware that the government in 2005 floated something called the Rajiv Gandhi Shramik Kalyan Yojana. That's an insurance scheme against unemployment. So it is um, applicable only to organizations. So if G2 has workers you know, whom he employs and he's, he had a salary outgoing, uh, then these are the kind of schemes that all uh, these kind of outfits should look at because the employer, I think, play, pays the premium. And uh, the workers are insured against loss of employment as long as uh, then they don't quit themselves. If they're fired from their jobs, if there's an accident on set, um, they are entitled to one year of uh, one year salary, right? So I think people are not aware of this scheme. Um, there are other uh, insurance companies like ICICI, Lombard, HDFC, uh, etc., who have uh, certain insurance packages which include as an add-on. They include a certain amount of unemployment as well, right? I don't know the details of that so well, but uh, there are these things, and I think you know conversations like this should make government, should make insurance companies sit up to try and look at when a pandemic like this happens, what kind of insurances can people get? You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the MSMEs, as Priyanka was saying, that really need the protection. Um, don't make it difficult. It, it needs to be a simple, so the Rajiv Gandhi uh, thing sounds actually very simple. Um, we need more schemes like this. More people need to... So, but coming back to your question, um, the organization, so I keep telling all musicians that you must become part of the larger collectives. In the music industry, we have a collective for composers and authors called the IPRS. Uh, the IPRS, after the COVID uh, uh, outbreak, uh, has created a fund and each member has been paid a certain amount. Similarly, collectives like PPL, PDL, uh, ISRA, you know, they, they pay out royalties regularly to members. PPL, I know, advance their payout when COVID happened. So if you're part of a collective, you know, there is some kind of money coming home to you. It's not necessary that it would cover everything, but something's better than nothing. So, they, they, they need, so all musicians who are listening to this, all composers, all authors, please look for these recognized kind of bodies, which can help, um, you know, take care of you to some extent. The other is, uh, you know, people like um, uh, technicians, engineers, and the daily wage earners. Even there, some kind of collectives need to be, uh, to be formed. So maybe we can't do it for this pandemic, but at least gear up for the future. Where um, uh, the other day, Vijay Beringal told me there are about 5,000 sound engineers in the country. Uh, 5,000 is approximately the number of members that IPRS has. You know, so there's a very good case for sound engineers getting together and forming some kind of association of their own. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of um, concerts and gigs have happened recently, raising funds, COVID, for musicians, for artists, etc., which is great. Uh, but I don't see any um, uh, efforts like that going towards technicians and sound engineers, for example. All right. So if we have tribute concerts, we can do tribute concerts to engineers. We can do tribute, tribute concerts to these workers. 
Um, and the other thing is that, you know, everyone has a certain amount of self-respect. Nobody wants to live off dole. So nobody wants to see it coming in as a charity. So if these organizations on a regular basis can undertake some activity that will raise funds, which could be paid out immediately, or they could stay in a corpus uh, uh, to, uh, to kind of take care of people at a crisis, uh, time of crisis like this, um, you know, that kind, it would go a long way. And, you know, I wouldn't feel so, it, it just feels awkward to say, you know, I'm getting charity. Thanks for that, Atul. Um, Neha, I'd like to bring you in here before we move on to Rebecca. Is um, how does a, an individual who is not a part of a company uh, get to a point where they are comfortable with asking for help, especially when it comes to money? Uh, and we know that that tends to be a massive barrier and also often the final frontier in some sense for, you know, as the edge for the want of a better word. How should one ask? Why should one ask? How can they get past that barrier? I think it's, um, well, so, uh, you know, I, again, just sort of relating it to my own experience because I've, I've been there. Uh, when I moved back to India um, after studying at the, in the UK, actually, the University of Arts, I, I didn't have any money and uh, I didn't know anybody in the art world, not, not one person. Um, and I basically said, right, I want to do an art fair, but I have no money and I don't know anybody in the art world. Uh, so what might be a good starting point, right? And with that, um, you know, and I suppose you do these things when you're 26. Now I'm a mother of a seven year old. I don't know if I have that energy, but I'm hoping a lot of people on this call are, are feeling young and enthused. And, and so, you know, basically I, I, I started by joining an organization that had something to do with the arts. And then I took a job uh, with an organization that had something to do with organizing events. And then I went and asked for a loan um, from my boss at the time. And he gave me a little bit of money. And then I set up the, the first art fair. And over time, of course, you know, he, he was my partner. And then I bought him out. And then we had foreign partners and so on. But it started with going and asking one person for some money to back my, my dream, right? Um, and I think that's, that's really the point. You have to have a dream. Um, and you have to want it and you have to recognize that you're willing to um, kind of, you know, do what it takes to be able to, um, you know, take those next few steps. And that's often hard because when you, when you're facing challenges, it's difficult to retain that connection with yourself. It's difficult to hear your inner voice. It's difficult to believe in your dreams, the challenges and environment around you. Everything is sort of breaking it up and, in, in, you know, sort of pushing you down. Um, and so the question really is, how do you do that? And, you know, just back to Atul's point and how do you just accept the reality, right? We, I think a lot of us have looked at it as a continuation. And so things have slowly gotten harder and we've sort of expected there to be a miracle or a change or a COVID free time. And then like now we're like too exhausted and that hasn't happened. And now we have no plan, right? Uh, but if we could look at it as just an acceptance of a new normal, right? And actually take a day and mourn that, if that's what it does to you, right? Deal with your feelings, right? If it's a death of a certain kind of life, if it's the death of a certain kind of career choice and a way in which you're doing that, deal with it, right? And I don't mean that in a bad way. We've all done that. We've all reinvented ourselves. We've explored skills that we didn't have. We've partnered with people where we couldn't develop those skills. I think a lot of challenges in the artistic community are that a lot of the other skills that you need to get on with life, uh, whether it's the financial skills or the legal skills or, or the management skills or the marketing skills are something that, you know, are, are, are hopefully coming in externally. And, and so when that doesn't happen, then, then there's a challenge, right? So I think it's a time for us to be able to internalize that either in ourselves or in the partners that, and, and the communities that we build at, back to Atul's point and, and Priyanka's point of, of having associations and then go from there. And so, you know, some level of acceptance, some level of mourning and dealing with that acceptance uh, and, and making that transition then and saying, right, you know, let me dust it off. And now this is where I'm at, right? Some level of gratitude, right? We have, you know, we're, we're talking about, we're talking about the arts, uh, which is something that will always inspire mankind and technology, something that will, that is here to stay clearly. Not a lot of people um, have that. So, you know, what, what, what this community has is something that will never go away. 
it'll never be replaced by technology right uh, people will always want the arts right it's it's food for the soul and it's it's got a life of its own so if we're able to just reinvent ourselves get the support system and maybe there are things you do for money and there are things that you do for your for your passion and for a period of time you might you might make the compromise that they're not necessarily the same things right mm -hmm. and so for 5 hours a day you may be you know i mean you know there are people who put themselves through med school driving an uber car right so you just have to think about where you get your money may not necessarily be the same as but you do have skills right and and so if you think about just how can i make my money and how can i keep my passion alive and the two needn't be the same for a period of time until i figure this out right and just deal with your own feelings while you do that then i think that's sort of some sort of a formula there you know what i what i hear from what all of you are saying and yes atul just just half a second is just this uh, atul and i were actually talking about this when we first started talking about the session of the stages of grief uh, acceptance mourning transition and it seems like you've sort of covered that in, in your responses so acceptance knowing that you can ask and when you do ask what does that mean mourn it because this is an unusual scenario for us to be in uh but also then transition and transition could be individual and collective maybe the collective might take a little more time but the individual can be activated very quickly so i'm just sort of drawing some some of these themes in from kashmi it's about surrender is about strength right uh, i think we look at we look at the idea of asking as weakness uh, but it's actually coming from a place of strength and uh, knowing that i know what i want i know what i'm doing this for i know where i can go with this and and i can help myself that's where most people need to start from anyway so i think the idea of asking and surrendering is that and you know somebody mentioned fear and typically you have you know it's either fear shame or the fear of shame that is holding us back uh, and all the all the little little fears kind of that's kind of at the bottom of it right so if we can just recognize that and pull out that bottom block that is holding us back then you'd find that all the little day to day fears just tend to dissipate thanks thanks for that and and with that theme and just again just one thing so i just wanted to say one thing yeah. that um, if you're an artist you know and in, if you're part of the arts community as as a creator you are blessed you have talent people like me don't have talent your ability to earn in a time of crisis is far greater than mine so understand that you are starting at an advantage don't don't get bogged down by the circumstances because you have talent and that's a great thing thank thank you for that atul um and with with also this sort of theme of acceptance and surrender i'd like to ask uh, all the audiences here who gathered all the attendees are we just going to bring up a poll uh, about seeing if you're looking for financial support because we've been compiling a few funds together what's available in the country and we can send that on uh, to you uh, so the polls just going to come up um, and the question is essentially is do you have access to financial support uh, so please request you to answer that um, and with that rebecca i want to bring you in but i'm just being mindful of the time and i'd like to bring you in after we play the the next and the final video that we have so we'll just play that and and bring you in and we'll pick up this financial question again uh, with you so team if you could also um, you know share the last video while this is on you uh, anybody who is watching you can move your poll screen um, it's a window move to to the extreme right so it doesn't disturb the video that we are seeing thank you hi my name is kamil uh, sound engineer professionally uh, do a lot of live events and recordings uh the simple query here is pre lockdown post lockdown pre lockdown was so much to do so much fun here comes a lockdown and suddenly we're all it's not just audio engineers i'm talking about lighting engineers with vjs stage techs artists uh music directors event managers even programmers even promoters or even vendors all put together are all mostly in the same boat where do we go from here to start with the problem we have to find a way where uh, till the lockdown lasts we all have some source of income to pay the bills the bills are there it's not that we have got any respite from uh, the current scenarios or even any of the offers made to us it's very limited i, I believe the easier way to find a way out is maybe collaborations as an as a performance it's a contribution to an event an experience that you take back home so how it has affected us today 
it's very evident to a lot of people not people, not many people saying much does not mean that we haven't been affected it has affected a lot of people difficult to come by a lot of people are going through stages of depression it's one of the things that is difficult for people to accept and even talk about yes mental health support uh, some way of starting to rejig the industry learn from our uh, past mistakes uh, reinvent the wheel so that survival of the fittest is not just the key as it is today how can i say this more easily let's try and form a team that works together grows together and thank you for that kamil uh, we've actually been uh, very amazed by the kind of responses that we have so i'd like to take a moment to also acknowledge all the videos so thank you so much if you're here and listening for that kamil um, but with that rebecca i just want to you know lock the ball in your court because one of the key things that we picked up from the previous set of videos uh, and what priyanka and atul also spoke about is the need to collectivize and self organize and figure out how we can do that so with that um, i'd also like to bring in a last area of our of our conversation today which is future of work so what does future of work look like but also what does future of the community look like and if you could mm -hmm. give, give us some sense of how is it that in the uk you're self organizing what are the trade unions that exist to support communities um and and if there are multiple like as a as a as a gig worker can i go to multiple organizations to be a part of that mm. yeah i mean thank you this the situation in the uk is is so incredibly different to the one in india that that i'm really pleased to have heard um some of the responses from from my fellow panelists because i think they have got a lot more useful things to say on exactly what needs to happen at this time and and my response is always going to be slightly sort of back and you know and, and more general however i do think I, i'm picking up on on what ethel said about the the invisible workers in all of this the people the artists who who uh, are centering themselves in all the discussions in the uk at the moment and i'm sure it's the same in india and, and what we're not seeing enough of not nearly enough of is is the people that we've just heard from who are who are behind the scenes who are who are making all of the art happen and i i think first of all that 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 needs to be said really really strongly that they that they need to be much more at at the forefront of our thoughts i think in the uk um there is a huge kind of a uh, moment of of people coming together to talk about this crisis and to talk about the change that they want to see after after we're out the other side of this crisis um and i think that they are be that those conversations obviously are being aided first of all by the unions by back to by the musicians union by equity so these big kind of you know that the the workforce here the creative workforce is it is very unionized and that is incredibly helpful at this time but it's also being led by all sorts of other groups that are springing up to to have those conversations in their local community and here in Wales in Cardiff um we have a, a a movement that is called what next and we meet weekly on zoom to talk about some of the biggest issues that we are facing as a community and that is incredibly helpful because i think unless you can really think about it at a local level then you then it's incredibly difficult to feed in truthfully and uh, into the bigger uh, nationwide discussions however I think those nationwide discussions are incredibly important and they must happen outside the big metros and not just be centered on the big cities. There are artists living all over the UK and all over India and I think one really important question is how do we give equal voice and equal value to those artists, you know, in in um Ahmedabad or in Cloyd in North Wales or in Middlesbrough or in Cornwall here in the UK or you know um and 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 that's a big question i think and i think it's one that really needs to be addressed in all of this to make sure that people are coming together they are lending their voices to a collective effort but that that collective effort really does represent all parts of india all parts of the uk um yeah and i think i think you know as i said i think it's really important that that here to remember here that there there is incredibly inspire inspiring and you know resilient kind of um conversations with independent artists happening and i and i i i do take comfort from that in a way having been an independent artist for a long time myself 
Thank you for that. So one area, of course, that you are, you are speaking about is the national level, the mega level way of self-organizing, which is associations, but the other is also a collective level, a community level way of organizing. I'd like to bring, uh, you know, um, um, Priyanka here. Priyanka, would you like to share something? I, I know we've been involved with Stain Alive, and that offers a different lens of you know, community support, particularly for the workers. Would you like to share a little bit about what's in store around Stain Alive so um, the audiences here can get a sense of what to expect? And I may have to request you to go off video again. Sorry about that. Okay, I think uh, we've lost Priyanka. So I'm going to have to move on to this. Uh, but we'll hopefully get her back on and respond, you know, get her to respond to this. But to the rest of you, um, given that we are in this new normal, as Neha, you spoke about earlier, what does the future of work look like uh, we are in in india we're in lockdown 4.0 we are still all working from home we're still not having face-to-face -face communication uh, there are challenges of there are sure. 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 okay um i think we've lost her again uh, but just to bring that back, we're in a, we are in a unique scenario. So if, if anybody can go and, and share with us your thoughts on what does the future of work for the gig worker look like, but also on the other side, what does it look like for the cultural festival in relation to this and the gig worker? So no, I, I, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just jumping in. But, uh, you know, to me, again, this is an opportunity that you're not going to get, right? In your daily life, when things open up, ease up, you'll go back to trying to do, you know, what you, what you were doing. And all the opportunities that you have today in terms of being able to think and create are going to be lost because you're not going to get after them the way that, you know, you, you would do it if this lockdown were to continue, let's say, till December. But the fact is that uh, I said it uh, on an earlier panel as well. You've got stuff like virtual reality. We haven't even touched virtual reality in the music business. And uh, Shatadru, you better send me a check for doing this. Uh, he was watching um, uh, the, the Global Citizen concert on Oculus and um, talking in real time virtually to people from Sweden and America and stuff like that. They're now going to start doing merchandise uh, at virtual concerts and you'll, you'll get them delivered at home through Amazon and stuff. So there's a very exciting world of virtual reality, which the music industry, and I'm speaking from the music industry, has not even started to tap into. Gaming is something that, so, you know, the, the numbers, and they could be wrong, but music has gone up by 14% in the lockdown. Uh, Netflix, Amazon kind of uh, audiovisual OTTs are up by 42%. Gaming is up by 140%. I checked at IPRS the other day. They have not issued a single license to any game playing music. I've checked with nephews and nieces. Um, they, have, they have games which are international games. There are no Indian games. There's a huge opportunity to marry gaming and music. But you have to start doing these things now. And like I said, you know, collaborate. If you're in the music business, reach out to people who are doing the gaming bit. Create something now. Because once you go back to gigging, you'll be trying to make up this lost revenue. You will not put your mind to it. So the future of work for you is collaboration. Find new ways because it's, an, it's a unique opportunity. Neha, Rebecca. Rebecca, actually, could, would you like to go next? Uh, can I just carry on that? I think one of the things I wanted to say earlier was, um, and, and you know, as, as somebody who's been the chair of a, a charity and, a, you know, and worked in, in theatre companies and been on boards for a long time, governance is incredibly important to me. And I've always emphasised how important it was, whether you're an individual artist or an SME or whatever, to get your governance in order, you know, to make sure that you, you know what you are, you know where you sit, you know what your regulation is and so on. However, I would say that in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in India, but even if you've been really organised with your government, say as an independent artist, you set up your own company, you know, um, actually it hasn't helped you because this is so big and so overwhelming that the government schemes that have come out in the UK, and they've been incredibly helpful, whether that's the furloughing scheme, which allows you to put members of your staff as a theatre, you know, friends of mine who are running theatres have furloughed 80% of their staff, meaning the government pays 
the wages of those staff um, up to 80 percent so you you don't have to bear that at this time that they're closed I'm incredibly important. but for the individual artists the ones who are not on salaries in these places even if they've organized themselves maybe they've turned themselves into a company or whatever it's been still incredibly difficult to access any of the schemes that the government have had on offer and so I, I think that just gives you a picture of just, you know, in, in a way, just how obliterating this is. Even companies that have got, you know, who've absolutely responsibly had a lot of money in reserves for disasters. You know, they've looked at their risk planning. You know, they've, they've really thought about it. It doesn't matter. It's too big for that. And, and I think it's important, I'm just going to mention really quickly that, you know, we, we are, Atom's, or, um, Atom's already mentioned this, that we're not at the moment sure when anything is going to reopen. You know, best case scenario, some are saying 2021, you know, but that's if there's a successful vaccine in the UK, which is a massive if, let's be honest. So, you know, I think living with this uncertainty um, um, and making room for this uncertainty, but still connecting, talking to one another, organising together is, is incredibly important. Thanks. Thanks for that, Rebecca. I'm also mindful of time, so I'm just going to take a couple of audience questions. And I know that our panel has some key takeaway slides. It's a, almost like a pecha kucha, a very quick run through. So just to be mindful of that, I'm going to take a couple of questions. Any, again, anybody can answer. Um, but one of them is about pivoting. There's an anonymous attendee who says that um, this person works as a stage manager for live shows. I've made peace with the fact that I may not have any income flowing till things are back to normal. With such a precise line of work, I'm finding it difficult to innovate and move on to other, other things. Even with the digital shift, there's no space for the role of a stage manager. There are not too many jobs available currently, no place left for us to use our skills anymore. What would you advise, what would you advise be for a person like me going forward? I mean, the one thing that I would say, uh, you know, which is also true for the future of jobs is I think, you know, we can, we can practically sort of stop thinking of us as certain brackets and certain titles and, and stage manager versus, um, you know, production versus sound. We, we've just got to accept the reality and the reality that is here to stay. And it's not going to change with the lockdowns because the level of infection and the, the you know, the, the virus itself uh, until a vaccine is developed and then there may be something else. So fundamentally, we just have to accept that there is a, there is a sea change. And if we're not prepared or willing to even try to innovate, then it would be very difficult for us. Future of jobs, I think a lot of jobs are going to go, right? Not just in specific sectors, but sectors will go, right? Sectors will merge, sectors will redefine, new sectors will emerge. Gaming and music will become a new sector and new people will define that, right? So it's, it's, imagine that there are no rules, right? In terms of what these employment buckets are and what your job title is. So if you make a list of just what are your skills and what are your interests, right? Start from a clean white piece of paper, no designation, no resume, no CV, nothing. And just simply say, what can I do and what do I want to do? And try and find as much commonality between that and, and go with that as a starting point. You may create something, you may innovate something new that might become a big sector of tomorrow, right? So I just wanted to kind of bring that reality shift because we're still moving from one lockdown to another. We are never going to get out of this mindset. Otherwise we, we've got to be able to just say, right, this is what it is now. You know, it's almost like shutting down this whole uh, chat window and then re-logging in. Right. Yeah. And that's, as, it's painful and it's annoying and some people may lose connection and all of that, but that's what life is. Right. Yeah. So it's literally that experience of logging in again to another zoom call and restarting. So I think that's, that's a good way, right? So you sort of, you know, take a piece of paper, put down, these are my skills. This is what I'd like to do. What can I do given the situation? Rebecca, Atul, from your side, and I'm again bringing in another uh, audience question. If someone was to do this, um, how do they take into account all the skills and experiences that they already have and use that in a practical way to build this list? So one question is, again, uh, from a festival production head and live performance curator. Uh, they are saying that uh, how do we capitalize on almost eight years of experience and skills and shift uh, to finding new kind of work. Uh, what are the devices that you would suggest that this, uh, that this person uses, but also what are the other possible opportunities that they could look for uh, in this space? Um, and, and this person is saying they just can't seem to wrap, wrap their he head around the fact that everything is going to go online. How does someone find a place for themselves in this new normal? Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, I think it's incredibly difficult and I, but I think it's also really important and what Nihara has said is really important. You have to look at your skills as skills. They are, you know, however you got them, however you came by them, they are incredibly valuable. And I think making a list of them without the association to any job or any um, classification of any sort is really important. And then you have to, I mean, and this is difficult for, for many people who perhaps are not nat natural networkers, not naturally getting out there doing things. But you, you, unfortunately, I think at this time, you have to go and join all those Zoom calls that are going on to find out what's going on, to find out where the opportunities are, you know, and and you might go, you might have to go to five or six in order to get, you know, information that, that is really important to you and will be important for taking your career forward. But it will be incredibly valuable. And now is the time because you're sat at home, perhaps, or you, know, you might have children, you might have caring responsibilities. And I don't underestimate that. But you may also have that time when you're not commuting to the office, you know, which is going to take an hour to really listen into conversations and, and join in with, with other people and, and, and address some of these questions. That's the thing. I think that's the thing that will help you to, to move on. Well, you know, um, uh, Rashmi, if, if the world is in creative mode now, saying that we have to develop new, new ideas and new platforms for the arts, uh, anyone with experience in the business is going to be invaluable because you have to bring that experience into play for the kind of experience that you're looking for in, in whatever you're building out. So for example, going back to the virtual reality thing, one of the big things at a concert is always the merchandise. And they're talking about putting up virtual merchandising booths where you can get stuff delivered home. So there you go. I mean, that has to have come from the experience of someone who's done a festival, who's done a gig, saying that you need a merchandising thing. So if you have uh, experience, it is invaluable. Thanks for that, Atul. And, and, I, like, and I like the way, uh, you know, Neha's comment has played off of your comments. So on the one hand, you start with a clean slate, start with this list of, you know, the skills that I have and what I need. But on the other hand, also acknowledge that what you have is valuable and really valuable and start from there as well as another touch point. I mean, in research, in, when I was doing my master's in a, in, a, in a thesis, we were always asked to start with acknowledge the fact that you know, you know something, start from there. And that's perhaps what both you and Rebecca have been alluding to that hold on to that value and work with that value and the needs and the skills will figure out a way of finding a new opportunity for you. Right? Okay, great. Sorry, can I just yeah. add one thing to that, which is that I think it's also, I think that's what you said, Rashmi, is incredibly important, but it's also really important to decide not what you want to say, but what you want to know and to go in to any sorts of meetings or, or events thinking, what do I want to know? So, you know, not feeling that you have to speak or that you have to say anything, but you do have to be curious and you do have to know what you want to find out, I think. Yeah. So it sort of goes back to the goal bit that we were talking about, knowing sort of what is it that, what is the question, answer that you're seeking? What are the questions that you have? And, as, as, and to round it up, as Atul said, collaborate, go back to the community, talk to other people. You're not alone. Um, and, and just to recognize that perhaps is, is the first step. Uh, but with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, the three of our panelists uh, who are here. I know that you'd like to share like a quick takeaway slide for the community. Uh, Atul, would you like to go first? Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, that's exactly what I said. First, accept the situation. There's no point stressing about something that you can do nothing about. Can you find a vaccine for COVID? You can't, then forget about it. You know, someone's job, it is someone's job to do that. They're going to do it. So accept your current situation and then look at how you can move ahead. You have to innovate. Like I said, you know, there are opportunities in the business. You can go out. I was talking about uh, Purban and Darshan having done a home from gig, uh, 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 sorry, a gig from home where they are trying to play with each other uh, and dealing with latency. You see, you can't remove latency, so you can't play perfectly in time but they've got a way of dealing with it. They're innovating. They're looking at how they can create gigs with the same musicians, but each one sitting in their own homes. Now you've got to put on your thinking cap and start thinking like that. There are enough and more examples of yoga teachers now taking classes on Zoom, you know, uh, fitness people doing the same thing. So you're going to start innovating immediately. A lot of people have started talking about concerts that are happening from home. There's a lot of them. Um, 
so you have to collaborate so you know these two points are interlinked you will collaborate you'll collaborate with people who have the tech know how so a kamil will suddenly become valuable to improving the sound that you have what uh, purban and darshan are doing will become invaluable in terms of playing with maybe musicians sitting in different countries you know so there is going to be a lot of innovation uh, like i said you have to look at uh, opportunities like gaming and vr so you will collaborate and innovate with those people reimagine yourself so i think both rebecca and neha have said this that is a new normal you are not stage manager for the virtual gig but you certainly have a role to play you certainly have something that you can offer over there so reimagine everything the internet is a great tool to reach out it's a great marketing tool it will not be the greatest in terms of monetization so you have to reimagine your own finances for sure rethink finance when you're talking about doing business on the internet and most certainly mobilize like i said get together form your collectives form strategies it's easier for a collective body to talk to another collective body so for example if technicians in music got together and spoke to a collective uh, of people who are developing games the conversations will flow much faster you'll find a lot of work processes will not be duplicated so that's my take away from this it's an opportunity use it to the hilt sorry that was me neha would you like to go next and while neha is about to start we're going to put up another poll asking about whether you'd like mental health professional support uh, please do answer if you can neha over to you yeah i think uh, you know just the point that you made about knowing what your starting point is um and so i just want to take take from that the first thing for me if i was to look at sort of four nuggets uh, the first is really knowing what your starting point is and what you're starting with right so what skills you have what resources you have what connections you have what motivation level you have what state of mind you are in right that's sort of what you're starting with and your limitations and constraints in your physical environment so knowing what your starting point is and accurately penning that down is very very important because otherwise you're working off the wrong sheet right uh, but once you do that then to be able to look at sort of either finding opportunities to rebecca's point about sort of logging in here and looking there and so on or creating it right and again just to say that this sector is the one sector that can actually create the opportunities that others would then also benefit from right so that's a really important thing to to what atul said as well i think the spirit that we have to adapt is one of adaptability and resilience right we are a world that is going to constantly change uh, today it's covid tomorrow it might be something else we just have to accept that change and movement is the new normal and the unpredictability and so you got to call yourself the ambiguity cruisers and then just sort of go with the flow right um and the the third to that is really just recognizing why i'm doing something what is it that i want to do and then i'm just going to figure out the when where and how right so work backwards from a purpose or a mission rather than trying to retrofit uh something and maybe do a what they call a swot assessment of your situation right and look at strengths weaknesses opportunities uh, and threats what i want to end with is that what's really important is in you know, knowing where you start and knowing how it's all going to work right and in that there is a degree of surrender and i always go back you know looking at it from a mental health perspective i always go back to the serenity prayer which is really around knowing you know help me knowing the things that you can control and things that you cannot control the wisdom to know the difference between those is really what we need to practice here so i would encourage everyone to print out the serenity prayer and stick it on their wall and whenever for big stuff or small stuff when you're stuck ask yourself can i control this can i change this did i cause this i did not therefore i need to look at what is what is in my control and then you don't have an excuse for being paralyzed because you have been able to segregate the stuff that was not in your control from the stuff that you can actually do something about right so that's a formula for action paralysis and i'm hoping that some of those uh, will give us the tools to actually go through life uh and not just our work life but just through life you know and and this new form of balance and the new normal uh and actually find uh new innovations that we could be grateful for thanks neha uh i know that priyanka is back priyanka uh, we're on the final uh, slide the one slide that you have would you please like to 
share with us some of that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. First of all, I want to apologize to everybody. I think we started talking about tech and everything that can technically go wrong has gone wrong at my end today. So I apologize. I'm clearly not having a good day with technology. Uh, and I feel terrible about it. So I'm very, very sorry for all of the dialing in and out. Um, but very quickly, I uh, want to just quickly share, I know uh, Rashmi asked me previously about staying alive as well. Um, and uh, before I dive into my key takeaways from this, the one quick thing that I want to share with everybody is uh, a lot of us here have the same sentiment that yes, there is a need to address and support the gig economy, the gig workers and the performing arts. Um, that's exactly what led to the birth of staying alive it's a bunch of us from the industry from different corners and different walks of the industry that decided to come together and uh, put put a collective in place an active community that is going to not only support but also educate and create awareness because i think all three limbs sort of go together i can't do one without uh, the other. So it's an initiative where we've come together. We want to try and reach out to as many people in the live industry and live event space to try and see uh, how we can support them, including financially, as well as help them uh, have an outlet where they can communicate, connect with others, collaborate, and try and do our best to educate them on a variety of topics, whether it's legal, commercial, financial, um, mental health related, opportunity wise, PR, and so on and so forth. So that's a little initiative by all of us. And for more information, please do feel free to check out our social media pages. Um, and then coming very quickly to what I would say is uh, the core takeaway from all of this. And I say this as someone who not just sees it from a commercial lens, but I also end up dealing with a lot of issues surrounding technology, innovation, intellectual property, more importantly. And I want to say that I, this is truly a time where we're seeing content flourish. And it's, when I say content, I don't just mean your mainstream sort of OTT, your streaming that you're, you know, live music streaming that you're seeing. I feel content for me cuts across the board, whether it's gaming, it's comedy, it's dance, it's cooking, it's, uh, you know, entertainment, music, all of it. And um, I don't think there's ever, we've never seen a revolution as we are seeing today. There's constantly new ways of communicating this content of how do we, keep producing it, distributing it. So um, I feel that the one thing that I would focus on is to keep your eyes and ears open for how these, how innovation is happening. You put more things out there, protecting your intellectual property, keep protecting your rights, uh, respect the rights of others in the whole uh, digital ec uh, ecosystem and uh, make the most of uh, this time that we have in terms of reaching out, collaborating and using technology to your benefit. So that's what my key takeaway would be. Thank you for that, Priyanka. And technology is technology, but we're glad that we're able to at least hear part of, uh, you know, so much. Uh, Rebecca, thank over to you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm not going to use slides because I'm going to try and do this quickly. Um, whilst um, I think the live experience cannot and never will be replaced by an online experience, I should have said that more clearly earlier on, I think we can make technology our friends and we can, as artists, use it better um, and as an additional paint in our paint box. And I think that it's fun, it can be fun to do that. I think what, what Athel said earlier about it's really important that you prioritise what you want to say or what you want to ask and that you use technology to perhaps help you on the journey towards answering that question. It's never going to replace the live experience, but it is important. I think um, organising locally is incredibly important because particularly at this time, no one can travel anywhere. But that's not to say that we have to be inward looking, um, you know, as a, as a country or as a community. What I mean by organising locally is that so that you can know, really know what's happening in your locality so that you can share that um, domestically across your country, but also across the world. That's what the world really needs at the moment. It needs in-depth knowledge, deep rooted knowledge of individual situations and places. Um, I think I would also say that, um, you know, 
resist and i know that i do this so i speak as somebody who does this resist at all costs comparing the inside of your life with the outside of somebody else's so social media is not always our friend in this situation because what you put on social media is what you want other people to see and what you do as somebody who goes on social media and i speak personally is that you then compare what the other person has wanted to say in their stage managed beautifully life with what's going on on the inside of yours look after yourself don't compare the inside of your life with the outside of somebody else's um, I think you have to work together like we have never worked together before. It is now more important to um, be collective and not to be competitive, actually, to be creative and, and to not, I mean, I know that we work in the most incredibly competitive business. I know, you know, I'm not naive about that, but now is not the time to foreground that competition. Now is the time to really work together, I think. And, and I think, you know, that involves sharing resources, it involves partnering up, it involves reaching out to people that you can see who are struggling, who are, you know, you, we're all struggling, but maybe some people are struggling more than others. And now is the time to be kind before anything else and to reach out to those people, I think. And finally, um, there was a question on the chat about pricing work. And I've got one thing to say on that, which is that if you're a woman, double what you thought you were going to ask for. As somebody who's worked in this industry for 20 years, I can tell you, and I think it's been borne out by all the research, women underprice themselves all the time um, compared to men. So if it's a woman asking that question, double it, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of Yes, Atul. You're on mute, Atul. more gender equality on panels well we've got jonathan now so, <laughs> uh, jonathan over to you for um and i'm sorry to just blow the gender equality for us for a moment <laughs> um i guess it's my job to try and summarize what's been an extremely rich and detailed couple of hours it's felt in part like a kind of collective advice session, therapy session, uh, insight session, and pragmatically also a useful session. Uh, if I'm just going to have a quick, have had a quick look back over our research in the taking the temperature research so far, just to see what's happened in terms of the, the sector that we've so far have completed the survey for us. It's, it's not by any way complete yet. But if I look at the findings to date, 41% of those who've done the survey have already stopped operating in this time. So that's clearly a concern in terms of how, how the lockdown is affecting people's ability to keep being creative. And yet 88% see the COVID-19 or the effects of it and how we function beyond the pandemic is here to stay. So there's something around denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, the acceptance and the bargaining that we, need to, that we need to focus on in terms of the actions. And as Priyanka was saying, I think get organized. Either formally, if you can join a group where you can formally get support, um, great. If you organize informally, um, either as artists or as a sector, that in itself will bring its own sense of spirit and sense of purpose. Because I think there is nothing worse than feeling lost, in denial, scared of what to do, and therefore inert. Getting organized, I think, is part of being able to do that, whether that's in a formal way by getting your business set up properly, looking at your finances, understand your finances more fully, so you're able to get your bottom line worked out. Where do you stand now? What are your skills? Your skills as an artist or as a technician won't go away. You'll be an artist in six months' time, you're an artist now. So understand what that means in terms of your transferable skills so you can apply them now in this time of lockdown and use them so that you're not in a position of having nothing to think about. And as um, Rebecca was saying, know what you need to know. You may not have the answers to that yet, but if you come into a conversation asking that kinds of questions or looking, be, um, be um, adventurous in this time so don't feel like you you're trapped in your houses we all are kind of make the most of this moment to reflect 
and then be proactive in what you can do with that. Um, because by being organized as yourself, being proactive, working together, I think from there will come something around resilience that will build towards the future. And just thinking about some of the resources that we're aware of, um, Rashmi herself could look at my ACRI's resource pages because there's a lot of um, resource there now you can turn to. Um, and similar um, in terms of the taking the temperature research also offers each month a mentorship. And, and I will be the first mentor from whoever um, has, um, gets drawn from the hat uh, in this first month to offer support now, actively now, not in six months time, but doing it now to help. Um, and on that basis, um, I'll just say a big thank you to Atul, Rebecca, Neha, Priyanka, Rashmi as always, the Artex team, the British Council's Arts team, our comms colleagues as well for helping us share the word of the um, webinars. And with that, thank you all. Thanks for joining online as well. We hope it's been useful. Handing back now to Rashmi to close the session and look forward to the next ones. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I just want to say that there's a phenomenal uh, set of very detailed and nuanced questions. We will be reaching out to the panelists after this and trying to get some of the responses for you. We will definitely send the Q&A. Um, we usually do this. We send the Q&A as a PDF to you uh, at the end of the session. So wait for it. It'll come to you by tomorrow at the very latest Monday. We'll also post the responses on our Facebook uh, you know, stream just so that people are able to access it. And lastly, uh, we've just been talking about what our next session would be, and it's going to be on digital models and pivoting for cultural festivals. So one of the key concerns that all of, you, all of us spoke about was how do we move to the digital space? We're going to be addressing that uh, by the end of June. So stay tuned, uh, continue uh, to reach out to us and uh, stay safe. A uh, big thank you once again to Atul, Rebecca, Neha, and to all of you for sticking around and having conversations with us and answering those polls and you know asking the questions, we will get back to you. And good luck. Uh, just a note to thank uh, everyone who sent in the videos. We should <laughs> all of them. Uh, and I'd just like to particularly thank Ramanjit Kaur, La La Land Festival from Goa, and um, Puppy Pandits, who were the first ones to respond with their experience. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye Priyanka.